Okay, welcome to chapter six, routing IP packets. This video is for the Network Plus N10006 exam. So some of the topics we're gonna be talking about, it's gonna be a basic uh, routing process, source, destination, routing information, characteristics and examples, address translation, and then we're gonna end it with multicast routing. So routing traffic. So what is routing traffic? Essentially, how are source and destination IP addresses used to route traffic? How do routed protocols differ from routing protocols? When multiple routing protocols know how to reach a destination network, how do you know which routes taken or chosen? What are the primary differences between distance vector and link state routing? How do the various types of NAT, network address translation, perform IP address translation? And what protocols are used to route multicast multi traffic? Okay, so in order for traffic to flow from one network to another network, the traffic has to be routed or a path has to be selected so that it can go from one network to another. That's what we mean by routing traffic. We're going to be introducing a few routing approaches. One of the special types of routing uses multicast, which we're going to describe here in a little bit. And then also we're going to look at address translation. Okay, so basic routing topology. We have one PC and a server, and we have two routers. And we want to go from one PC to the server one. So first thing we have to think about is how do we get to our default gateway? And we may have a MAC address of all ones. And we know the IP address of our default gateway, but we don't know the MAC address of our default gateway. So we're going to go ahead and send out a ARP request for our gateway so that we can get its MAC address returned. So source and destination is going to be our computer and the destination IP address. We are looking for the MAC of the default gateway. We get an ARP reply and that way our data frame can now be full. It will have source and destination, both MAC and IP. The router will get it and the router will process it and then send it out its interface. Here the data frame will be sent out its serial interface, this guy right here, and it knows that this network may be destined for the 192.168.3 network, and it has a table that says anything with that IP address, send out serial one, but you'll notice the source and destination MAC addresses, because this is at a layer three, no longer are present. But we may not know how to get to 192.168.2.2, or we may not know the MAC address of this guy over here. So the next step should actually be for router one and router two to be able to communicate. It will forward the packet over to router two. Router two will strip off the MAC address of router one, and it will have to figure out what MAC address belongs to 192.168.3.2. And again, we'll send an ARP request, and it should get a reply. That way, router two knows how to forward the destination IP and destination MAC. Notice we are still using the IP address of PC1, but the source MAC address is the outside interface, our FA interface of router 2. That's because at each step, the MAC address is stripped off, and as the frame leaves the device, it takes that outbound MAC address. 
and then that way it will get it and it should be able to respond all the way back to PC1 now. So sources of routing information, they normally come in three different ways, directly connected, static, or dynamic routes. Static routes are one that we manually input. Directly connected ones are things that you are right next to. Dynamic routing protocols, those are ones that are shared via routed or routing protocols. Examples of routed protocol or directly connected, sorry, are ones going to know about this network because it's connected. R1 will also know about this network because it's connected. R2 will know about this network and this network. R2 will not know about the 192.168.1 network. That's because it is not directly connected. We can actually have static routes so that R1 knows about this network if we manually put it in or we can tell it forward everything out of that interface, 0000 slash 0. That means everything will be sent out that interface. And on R2, we can have everything forward back to our, our, the internet, as well as anything designated or designated for that network is sent back to R1. That's one way of doing it versus dynamic routing protocols, we could actually set so that each router learns about one another and they share information. This is done via routing protocols. Routing protocols come in two flavors. Normally, distance vector and link state. We're not quite there yet. So a routing protocol will advertise route information between routers. That's like RIP, OSPF, EIGRP, BGP. Routed protocols are protocols with addressing schemes that define the different networks. That's going to be the addressing portion, like IP. So the believability of a route, this is known as, or the trustworthiness of a route, it's called the administrative distance. And that means that we're going to believe or trust the network with the highest, sorry, we're going to trust the network with the lowest administrative distance because that lets us know which is going to be the most trustworthy. Default administrative distances for directly connected networks Administ or the AD of zero. Statically configured one, EIGRP 90, OSPF 110, RIP 120, external EIGRP 170, unknown is 255. But that way, whoever has the lowest AD is the one that we trust. Metrics, how do we figure out which is the best route? And this is going to be depending on the routing protocols and the metric that they use. For example, some metrics could be hop count, could be bandwidth, reliability, latency or delay, or other metrics, or combination of metrics. For example, OSPF may take into account hop count and bandwidth. Other things we have to discuss are things like this. In, or interior versus exterior gateway protocols. Are we going to be linking between multiple ISPs or inside of one ISP? Exterior gateway protocols operate between autonomous system numbers. Here we may have three different ISPs. Each of those ISPs may uh, have exterior gateways so here's one giant network. It may have more networking equipment inside of it, but here's just one sphere of control, one ISP, and it may provide internet to a different ISP. The interior gateway, it's going to be used with local in that AS number. Exterior gateway protocols will allow 
between AS communications. Interior gateway protocol, IGPs, versus exterior gateway protocols, EGP. What's really funny is BGP is the best exterior gateway protocol, but BGP can also be a interior gateway protocol. All right, moving on. Distance vector versus link state. These two are very important. Normally, our routing protocols fall between one of these most of the time. Distance vector sends a full copy of the routing table to its directly connected neighbors at regular intervals. So full copy, even if no changes were made. It's slow to converge, meaning it's slow to get everyone the same information. This one will use hop count as a metric. It also uses hold down timers, split horizon, and poison reverse for loop avoidance. So what's split horizon and what's poison uh, reverse? Routing loops may occur in distance vector protocols, so one of the following is typically implemented to remove our loops. Split horizon. This feature prevents a routed or route learned on one interface from being advertised back at that same interface. Or poison reverse. And this feature causes a route received on one interface to be advertised back out the same interface with a metric considered to be infinite. Essentially, if I learn a network based off of one interface, I will not send that network back out that interface. Link state attributes. Routers do not exchange the full route tables. Routers send link state advertisements, LSAs, to advertise the networks they know how to reach. So no full map. The routers then use the LSAs to build a topology map. Here, we use the shortest path first algorithm, and we use this to build our routing table. New LSAs are only sent when topology changes, meaning we don't have to send the entire route table if no changes were made. Even if the change is made, we only have to send the portion that was changed. So some examples like RIP, Routing Information Protocol, it's distance vector. Open short and fast first, OSPF, it's link state. EIGRP is a more advanced distance vector. ISIS is link state, and BGP is a path vector, and this is mainly used for exterior access, so not that big of an issue. Remember, distance vector sends the full map. Link state only sends changes that were made. Moving on is address translation. Because of the limited supply of IPv4 addresses, we had to have a way of masking private addresses so they could get on the internet. And what we came up with was network address translation, NAT. It allows us to mask one public IP address to several private IP addresses. One variation of NAT could be port address translation. That's based off of the port. Other examples could be dynamic NAT, and that's where the IP address is automatically assigned from a pool in a one-to-one -one tra translation. Or we could have IP addresses manually assigned, that's one-to-one, -one, or we could have port address translation, PAT, and that's where multiple private IP addresses share one public IP address. That's more of a many-to-one translation. Here's an example. Here, everything will be mapped to 17171100/24. So anything between 171711 through 17171 and 254 
will be able to be used because we have our address masquerading or mapping to that subnet. Then it actually will map our inside local address to our inside global address. Inside's on this side, and then they're going to be configuring to those mask address on, on our outside interface. Next is PAT. PAT is going to use port numbers. But everything's going to be mapped to the 1717.1.100. But it's going to use different port numbers to identify which hosts it's using. Moving on to our multicast. So multicast serves two primary uh, protocols that use this. IGMP, which went away because we use EIGRP, and we have PIM, Protocol Independent Multicasts. IGMP, which is not always the same type of IGMP that we just discussed, could also be a group management protocol, and that allows us to join multicast groups. PIM uses multicast, which allows us to control traffic between multicast-enabled routers. Examples of IGMP is we have a IGMP join message that may join a multicast source. And that way we can forward traffic maybe to non-receivers. PIM, protocol independent multicast, there's two different nodes. PIM dense mode, this uses periodic FUDs and pruning behaviors to form a optimal distribution tree, but it causes a negative performance impact, so we don't use this very often. Or we have PIM sparse mode, initially used by shared distribution trees, which may be suboptimal, but eventually it does create an optimal distribution tree through the shortest path tree, SPT switchover. So let's look at our dense mode flooding. It will flood everywhere. Pruning then starts pruning the different repetitive links. After pruning, we have one path. As opposed to shared distribution, it can take multiple paths. And after certain types of SPT switchover, it could have a dedicated path. That's actually it for this chapter. I want to thank you.